Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to be with you here today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the work that my team is doing. And uh, since we are in research, we are looking a little bit forward to what the future of software engineering will look like. And there are many scenarios, and I will show you uh, a few of them. Um, but whenever you actually look into the future, it's always good to actually first look back a little bit. And so that's what I want to do. And uh, the first thing that I want to point out is that software engineering is really a young science. Uh, the first software engineering conference was actually in 1968 at, uh, in Germany, uh, Garmisch-Partenkirchen, and was organized by Friedrich Bauer, um, a German professor, which happens to be my... PhD's advisor, advisor. So in some sense, I'm uh, in the tradition. Um, it turns out that at this first conference on software engineering, they did not only define what software engineering is, but immediately they figured out, oh, we have actually a crisis, and maybe we have that crisis today. So one of the first definitions of software engineering was actually the following one. It says, uh, produce high quality software with a finite amount of resources to a predictive schedule. So this looks like a, a definition that could actually be applied to other areas as well. So let's simply replace software with automobile. Then we would have automobile engineering. Produce high quality automobiles or cars with a finite amount of resources to a predicted schedule. What does that tell us if this is the definition of software engineering and this is the definition of automobile engineering? It means that software engineering is actually not so much different, right? We deal with different artifacts, but in some sense we have the same problems as other engineering disciplines too. And so what I wanted to show you today is actually that now and then it's actually worthwhile to look into other engineering disciplines and see what is actually going on over there to see is what can we actually learn for software engineering. So the three things that I want to talk about is actually what can we learn from other areas. Uh, in the first time, it's I look into analytics. How are other areas using the data that are actually uh, collected during the pro process of producing something? And for software engineering, I will look into how do we can use some of the data for what is called and as branch analytics, which is in some sense a completely new area, but uh, will have uh, most likely a big impact. The second area that I want to look at is what uh, happens in hardware. So in hardware, formal methods have been quite successful. Why haven't they actually been adopted in, uh, in software yet? And so I'll show you uh, one example uh, about equivalence checkers that are used in, in uh, hardware and now are also making it into software. And uh, last not least, we are probably the most, the field where advances are most rapid. Uh, so 10 years ago, very few people had a cell phone. Today, lots of people have a cell phone. 20 years ago, there was no internet. Today, one third of the uh, population, world's population is connected to the internet. So what does that actually mean if you build software and how can we use these new platforms? Okay, so this is my agenda for today. Feel free to interrupt me if you don't understand uh, um, and otherwise uh, I'm around. And I will uh, also have a booth tomorrow where I am happy to answer questions. So let's go into the first area, analytics. So if you look into the business community, then uh, the, one of the most successful books of uh, 2010 was the book by uh, Devonport and Harris on analytics at work. And so what's uh, the observation? The observation is that in most industries, they use, in some sense, the data in order to make better predictions, to make smarter decisions, to get to better results. For example, the uh, uh, insurance uh, uh, industry 
is using, is using uh, statistics a lot in order to determine how expensive will your life insurance be, depending on your health record. Um, the financial industry is in some sense making prediction models on how the stock will behave so that they sell or buy stock. Healthcare prediction will be made in uh, whether you are very healthy or whether you have a certain condition and therefore should actually go earlier to checkups. So all these industries are in some sense using lots of data to optimize their processes. Uh, it turns out that uh, when Davenport wrote this book, he didn't mention software engineering. And that's actually true, because we as engineers building software, we rarely use the data when we build the software to optimize our process. So before going how we can use that data, let me show, show you something else that I thought was uh, quite uh, insightful. Uh, Davenport also presented this table that says is if you have certain data, then you can look at, did you collect the data in the past? And then you simply report what has happened. Um, is the data current? And maybe you can already uh, do an alert. For example, um, when the stock exchange in the US crashed in May uh, 2010, then uh, suddenly uh, certain stocks dropped rapidly. And so what the stock exchange then introduced as an alerting mechanism, then if, if a certain stock drops more than 10% in five minutes, then they stop the trading for that stock. So they just use real-time data to make a decision. What is actually going on in software engineering? Do we have an alert mechanism? Maybe it's not good to continue on this path um, for further development. And so we will look into see is whether we can build tools that are actually alerting or recommendation for software engineers. So the area that we want to apply this on is uh, branch analysis. So if you build Windows or Office, you have hundreds, actually thousands of engineers working at the same time on the same product. And so it's like building a concurrent systems where you have lots of actors that do something. And uh, for software systems, we know that we have to, in some sense, make sure that they can work independently. So for big software systems, for people, you use a similar mechanism. So you use a version control system where you can actually create branches. So you take a snapshot of the certain system, and then everybody can work independently and check in independently his, uh, his changes. But at a certain point, you have to merge these changes back together because you, ultimately you want to build one system. And so the good news is about branching is it's really uh, uh, um, uh, isolates concurrent work so that people can work independently of each other. But there is in some sense uh, a cost involved. Namely, you're not longer that agile. Not everybody developer over here sees actually the changes that are going on over there. And if they actually see those changes too late, wow, you can't actually build the system anymore because there are different assumptions that, and, and decisions that have been made. And so we call this code velocities. If you check in as an individual developer, then it's the time of this check-in in his particular branch until it reads the, reaches the main branch and so that other people can depend on it. And so depending on uh, product groups, it takes between two days that somebody checks in and it's available to almost a month that, this, that the changes are available elsewhere. So that's really a huge amount of uh, time. And so you want to be more agile. So can we actually quantify how bad the situation currently is? And so here's just the visualization of what goes on in these uh, branching systems. So this is uh, one particular file um, somewhere in Microsoft. And uh, the blue dots are actually changes to that file by different people. We'll talk about that later. Um, so there are probably 30 changes to that file. Then. The orange dots are all integration. So this particular file has to integrate into this branch, has to integrate into that branch, has to run promoted to over there. And then only then, oh, there is this black dot. That means there was some collision. And so they had to undo something that happened three weeks ago in a completely different branch. And so that's a bad state of affair. Um, so we want to optimize it. But how can we actually optimize working of people together 
what kind of data can we use? And so uh, this is uh, what's known in the software engineering community as empirical software engineering. They use quantitative and qualitative uh, measures. So qualitative is they ask actually the people that do all these integrations, what is actually your problem? Why doesn't it work better? But then we also look at the data and we mine the development data between, of the, uh, for the relationship between the teams that are doing something and the branches. And then we can even simulate, if we figure out, oh, maybe there's a better way to build the system, we can simulate how we would have built Windows in a better way. And then based on these insights, we can build alert mechanisms. We can tell three weeks in advance that there will be an, uh, a merge conflict later on because there are two people working at the same time on the same file. We can build recommenders and so on. So this is what I want to do. So three slides, very quick survey. So we'll ask people what goes wrong in building these big systems for these branches. And there were more or less four major complaints. They called something like Big Bang Merge. The manager decides, oh, now everything has to get together. And of course, there are lots of different things that come together. It never really works. You want to do it once by one, slowly. The other part is there's development freeze. People want to have a stable snapshot. And that means that other people shouldn't actually add stuff at, as you go along. So both of these actually are managerial decisions. In some sense, we can't really optimize those. And better we don't do those decisions. But then there are two things that we can optimize. One is called the integration wall. That simply means that people and the branch structure somehow don't fit together and therefore you can't, there's always these lots of these uh, conflicts. And the other part is that because people are afraid to change something that other people in some sense, uh, that, that will break other people, they introduce more branches, more branches, branches. And so this is called branch mania. So we want to get rid of those unnecessary branches. So two things we want to integ uh, address, integration wall and branch mania. Integration wall. How can we figure out whether the branch structure and the people working on branches, that they, uh, that they um, uh, fit together? So we can simply take a cross product of all branches, and then we say, is, OK, for if you now take two of these branches, what are actually the files that are changed? And what are the people who are working on those files? And then we can build a heat map. And so here's a heat map for Windows Vista and Windows 7. So the first observation is that uh, so um, there's a, on the x-axis there's file similarity and on the y-axis there's a developer similarity. So then you first uh, observe that the best part is actually most branches should be at a place where people that work on files and branches, if there are two different branches, that they are really separate. So that means that they can work on independent Different people work on independent files. That's great. So most files should actually be there. Uh, then if the same developers work on different files, it's also OK. It's even OK if the same files in different branches are worked on by the same people, because they know, in some sense, what goes on. But what is actually really bad is if there are the same files that are worked on in different branches by different people because they don't know of each other. And so the, the files that actually fall into this uh, red uh, square, they are particularly bad. And now you can see is how actually organizational change impacts typically also the behavior over time. From Windows Vista to Windows uh, uh, 7, you suddenly see that there are more files here where there are different people working on the same files. So maybe this was a not such a great organizational change, or maybe it was a different branch structure that was not optimal. So uh, you really can track as how you organize your work over time. So then the question is, now from all those branches, we know now which branches are difficult, but which one should we actually take out and, and uh, optimize away? And so one of the ideas is, since we have the whole history with all the check-ins for Windows, we can replay this history and take out particular files and then check whether we are actually faster 
um, if these files wouldn't be there. And so we do this, and so we'll take out different, uh, different branches, and then we can observe that there are certain files that in some sense um, only add cost. So they don't really help with conflict avoidance, but since you also have to check in there first, it takes longer until this check-in actually reaches main. And so all these dots are actually particular branches, uh, and the red dots, the branches that are red, we can take them all away and therefore have fewer branches and so more agility in the system. And so that's actually what's currently going on. And so what's really interesting is you can optimize processes by really looking at the data that you are collecting in the process. One of those data is branch analytics. It really helps with better design of a development structure, efficient scheduling, and it turns out if you actually have fewer conflicts, it also turns out that the number of bugs that are released afterwards are fewer. So it even helps in some sense with bug avoidance. So this was analytics. Let's go to the hardware industry and see what goes on over there. So in hardware industry, there's one thing that has really made a big uh, uh, change for them. And this was, in some sense, introducing formal methods uh, for equivalence checking. In hardware, you build socket designs, and socket designs are Boolean formulas. And so what, uh, what people want is to have one socket design, and then they want to tweak it a little bit, and then still want to make sure that, in some sense, the, the uh, tweak design is exactly like the one that they had before. And so it really checks for equivalence of circuits. So since these are all Boolean formulas, you can actually represent them very compactly in so-called binary decision diagrams or as satisfiability formulas. And there's a technology, for example, uh, for, for checking those uh, SAT formulas that is probably 100,000 times faster today than 10 years ago due to advances in the algorithms, due to advances in hardware, and many other little places. So in some sense, this uh, area of uh, checking of, of uh, formulas has seen a really rapid increase. So it was actually very, it's very successful in, in, in hardware. There are several companies that produce those tools, and they are used by Intel and, and by Siemens and other big companies. Why didn't actually that has... Uh, happen for software yet. And the problem is that software is more complex than hardware because we do not only deal with Boolean formulas, we deal with, in some sense, integers, we deal with a whole heap, we deal with concurrency, we deal with abstraction, and so that makes it much more difficult to do equivalence checking of software. But the good news is if we could do that, we don't have to write a specification for software because we have one version and we can check is the next version, maybe the optimized version, does it still do the same? And so that would help with automatically solving these merge conflicts, for example, because, oh, maybe all the changes that this person did was performance improvements or memory improvements, but it should still be the same. So if we would have equivalence checking for software, it would be really cool. The good news is we are there. So how does that work? So I said is digital circuits, you translate into Boolean formulas. And so what you actually do with uh, programs, you translate them also within formulas, but formulas that have then actually uh, operations from integers or, uh, or modular arithmetic in them. So here is a, a simple swap example. So there are two swap procedures. They should be the same. The first one uses an additional helper uh, uh, variable. The second one uses arithmetic to do the same thing and doesn't use an additional uh, 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 memory location. So what do we do is we translate this into formulas. As we see, is there's always a single assignment to one variable. So we can actually def uh, uh, represent it as an equality. And then we name the output variables as well, simply as swap1.x, for example. So this is our first translation. Here's our second translation. So now we have two formulas. Oh, we can actually talk to a theorem prover and see whether they agree. So what are the property that we want to check? We want to check that the outputs are the same. But there's this little tilde before that. So actually, we don't check that they are the same. We check 
that they are not the same. And why is that? That is, has something to do with this uh, particular technology for uh, satisfiability checking. We can now ask this, uh, we give this formula to a theorem prover, and if this theorem prover says it's unsatisfiable, that means that we have double negation, and so then we know exactly, oh, those two programs are the same. But if they are not, uh, if they are uh, satisfiable, then we get an assignment of uh, values to these variables that gives us a counterexample what went wrong. And so that's really the key how you can now uh, check for equivalence of programs. Of course, as I said, programs have heap, programs have also procedure calls. So one thing is, oh, if there are procedure calls, we can simply unfold the procedure, so we simply inline all the procedures. The formulas get bigger and bigger. As a consequence, the theorem prover can't handle them. So you need something smarter. It turns out that if you have a problem like this one, we have two methods, foo one and foo two, and both call bar. But it's the same bar. We know that it's the same bar. Then we can simply say, oh, we replace this. Instead of unfolding the definition of bar in these two foo methods, we can simply take a symbolic representation of this procedure that's called now f bar. And now we have something that works for uninterpreted functions. We have the property that if the arguments are the same, then the results have to be the same. And so if the arguments to the two bars are the same, wow, then we can simply take that as a result of, of uh, calling those bars. And so we use uh, the following trick here that we have this implication. And with this implication, we don't have to unfold the definition of the bar method here. We can simply represent this bar as an uninterpreted function. And so the program that we want to prove equivalent doesn't, doesn't grow in size because we can represent those procedure calls symbolically. Um, OK, so what can you do with equivalence checking? So now we have seen two programs that are typically written in C sharp or C. Um, and we can check is are actually the two versions the same? Or are they the same modulo, some little change that we made? But we can also do something else. We can say is are two versions the same that are that we have compiled into different uh, languages? For example, we compile C sharp into Microsoft intermediate language. And we can compile C sharp also to x86. And now we can see is, or, or we translate IL to x86. And now we can see is, are these two programs still the same? And so this is what's known as translation validation. So the same technique, equivalence checking, works well for application compatibility checking as well as translation checking. OK, so we build a tool uh, that's called SumDiff. And uh, the idea is it should work exactly like a syntactic tool that only looks at what, uh, what lines have changed. But uh, it uses actually a theorem prover underneath, and it uses some intermediate representation, which is called boogie. And so uh, we built it in such a way that you can actually take C or C++ as source language, or ARM, or .NET, or x86. And the way that it's built is like this. So there are the two program files that uh, are fed to the SumDiff. And then either it says, OK, it's equivalent, or it's not equivalent. And all the adaption to the different source languages are actually uh, done outside of SumDiff in the first translation into an intermediate format, which is called Boogie. OK, so let me show you this uh, uh, in real life. Um, so I have a little C program here. Uh, and the first one is actually an expression evaluator. On the left hand, you see an expression, and it is actually p expression is then a pointer to expression, so it really lives in the heap. And we have the same structure on the right hand side, but the evaluation procedure is written very differently. Uh, the evaluation procedure, as you see here, uh, uses in some sense macros, uh, uses uh, locals, uses a switch operation, whereas on the left-hand side it's uh, simply an if-then-else. Okay, so let's take uh, SumDiff and see what happens. Here's this uh, tool. We simply can run it, 
And uh, what it does is actually it builds in some sense a formula, gives the formula to the theorem prover, checks whether they are unsatisfiable, and then it, uh, it generates a trace if they are different or it says most likely they seem to be the same. In this particular case, they are the same, but there are some caveats. That's why it says uh, uh, they appear to be partially equivalent. Okay, but this is good enough for us, so they are the same. So let's do a little change in our program. So um, one thing that we could do is, for example, let's assume the next version of our program had an additional uh, multiplication case in there. And uh, so we run SumDiff again, and uh, let's see what happens this time. This time it says, oh, I actually generated a counterexample for you, and this counterexample we can inspect. It's uh, in a trace. So it's exactly the same program, left and right, but now it does something else. It adds something in these brackets. So uh, let me show you. Um, no. We have, in some sense, now new information here. Oops. Uh, so here we say is E is actually our um, pointer into the heap. So here it just assumed it's minus 72, 70, 22, and the operation is 3. So it found actually the fact that we have actually added a multiplication. So for the uh, uh, right-hand side, we have exactly the same. Um, uh, it's the same heap. It's, uh, the operation is still 3. And then we uh, execute. Since the operation is 3, we fall through, and we actually get uh, to uh, uh, that the expression is still minus 72, 22, but the result is minus 1 in the first case. But in the second case, the result is actually 0. And that's due to the fact that we actually fell through this case and actually we run into this uh, multiplication case and therefore that's actually where our bug now appeared because they don't do exactly the same anymore. Okay, with this uh, let me come back and uh, uh, see what happens here. Um, so what happens is that due to the fact that these tools are now so, these uh, theorem provers are so powerful, you can translate programs into formulas and then you can check all kinds of properties. For, uh, you can, we will later see how we actually use that for test case generation. You can use, use it for um, 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 uh, design space exploration, but here what SimDiff really does is actually it helps with automatically deciding on whether a refactoring didn't in introduce any um, different new behavior. It uh, helps with compiler translations, so in fact uh, Microsoft uses the same technology to verify that new compilers actually are uh, comparable with old compilers. And you can also do refinement checking, so if, there, if you fix a bug, then what you allow in, uh, between the two programs is that for the case where the old program still has a bug, that the new program has some new behavior, it's not a bug, but every other place where uh, program was defined before should be defined afterwards as, uh, as well. Okay, so this was in some sense how you use uh, logic-based tools for doing program analysis. Let's uh, move on to the next topic. And the next topic is what happens with our platforms. So one thing is that uh, uh, meanwhile, there are uh, almost one third of all the population is connected to the internet, and uh, it turns out that the browser is the most wisely, wise, widely used um, application. But uh, we, as educators, we want to, in some sense, also uh, excite our students to use um, uh, to start programming. And uh, why can't we do both? So we can maybe use the internet. We can probably lure people in because people love to play. So what does that mean? So we can actually develop, uh, we have developed uh, a tool that is actually is uh, uh, used by Microsoft and shipping for test case generation. But we don't use it for test case generation. We use it for solving puzzles. And so what's the puzzle? I just talked about equivalence checking. Is you have a hidden program that you don't know and the user writes a program that should match exactly the same behavior. And if they are equivalent, the user wins. And if they are not equivalent, then the user gets an uh, advice on how to proceed. 
So let me show you this uh, uh, live. So um, I hope it works live. So this is uh, PEX for fun. And the first observation is uh, uh, it's a real website. So go to this Go to this website, pexforfun.com, and then, oops, you can't see it, so it's pexforfun.com, and where you can do everything that I show you now, you can do um, with me or uh, maybe a little bit later. Okay, so here is our first program. Uh, it's a simple puzzle, and so currently it's simply called the method puzzle, takes an integer, returns an integer. What can you do? You can ask Pex. Um, execute this for me and find me an interesting input for this program. So what's the uh, um, um, what's the interesting input? So here uh, the input is whoops uh, is uh, i is zero and as a consequence the result is zero as well. And so what you get is in some sense these wonderful tables that tell you something about the, the relationship between input and output. So that was not too surprising, but uh, notice that it found some interesting input. Okay, so let's, uh, let's make it a little bit more interesting. Okay, we'll ask uh, if, it's, if we return one, and of course now we get a slightly different input. Oops, sorry, a slightly different input. Here that uh, we get uh, Z zero as input and the output is one. Okay, not uh, too surprising. Uh, let's uh, do something more interesting and say is, oh, if we actually say is, if i is one, two, three, four, uh, equal, equal, then we throw an error and we say is, oh, the system crashes. Okay, so let's see what happens now. And so what we should see is actually at least two cases. Uh, one where everything is fine, and now we get, we get uh, our error case here, where we get one, two, three, four is our exception. So how far can we push this? This can be, as I said, arbitrary complex formula. So we can say is i times three, maybe, plus seven, can we still find an input for this one? And of course now we ask the theorem prover, give me actually an assignment, and oh, it turns out that the input for 409, 409 drives exactly the, uh, the execution into this exception. So that seems to be good. So, but we really want to build puzzles. So how do we build puzzles? We have to define what, uh, what an assertion does. So let me introduce an assertion. So we introduce a public void uh, static void method that we simply call assert. And so it takes a Boolean B. And so what it does is if, if, if the Boolean does not hold, then we throw and we throw a new exception, and now we simply say is, um, assertion assertion failed, and uh, we are done. And so this one we say is, oh, let's, uh, let's simply call this assert method, and since we want to assert this, we want to make sure that we only pass this if it's not unequal, and so we throw away this guy, and this is now our new program. So it should almost have the same effect, except that we called uh, uh, procedure here. Uh, that's our assert, and um, let's see what we actually the system found. Oh, it behaved still the same, right? But now we can say, so now we have a nice mechanism how we deal with assertions. Now we can say, okay, let me introduce a public int method that's actually uh, the hidden implementation, int i. And so what the hidden implementation does is maybe it just uh, returns it's the identity. And now let me introduce the user. Oops. Sorry. Public user gets an int i. And so what uh, the user probably has no clue, initially just returns a constant. 
And so what's our assertion here? Our assertion is that hidden hidden of i is equal to user of i. Right? Uh, so and we have to change this one to avoid. Okay. So now we have uh, two methods, hidden and user. And so let's see what happens now if we ask pex. Oh, the method must have a return type, so maybe that's not uh, uh, it's a static int, and it has to be a static here too. Okay, so that was a compiler error. Okay, and we see, oh, the assertion has failed. So now you have seen that we can use these assertions in order to compare these two functions. So what PEX now really is, is in some sense a mechanism in which you uh, can, uh, in which we have given and other users have given you actually uh, 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 programs, and uh, there are hundreds of them. In fact, there are more than hundred thousand people that have used uh, PEX so far. And so here is, for example, a challenge arithmetic example. So now this uses exactly the same structure that I showed you before, but now you don't see the hidden program anymore. And you ask PEX, and PEX found one difference to our program. So let me scroll down a little bit. And now here you see, oh, it says if my, oh, sorry, if my, if my input x is zero, then I also return zero, my own implementation, namely the, the puzzle function over there. But the secret implementation returned zero as well. So that seems to be good. But if I actually look at the next case, then we have a mismatch. And so I'll give a, so the system gave a one as input. I still return zero because it's a constant, but the secret implementation returned minus one. So if I want to win this puzzle, I have to match this input-output pairs. So I can be, in some sense, brute force, and many people start exactly like this. They say, oh, if I actually have, uh, if my x is 1, then I return, uh, then I return minus 1. Okay? So that seems to do the, oops, sorry, that seems to do the trick. So let's see what Peck says in this case, right? That was, we only saw two entries. But the system says it's a little bit smarter and says, oh, but if I give you actually a 2, you still return a, a 0. But what I really want to see is a minus 2. So somehow this, uh, adding these additional cases doesn't really help. And so um, anybody knows what to write over here? What should I return over here? Minus x, OK? So let me introduce minus x here and ask uh, Pex again. And uh, Pex is thinking, and uh, hopefully, oh, uh, it tells you you have won the coding duel. Yeah. OK, wonderful. So uh, the funny thing is what we see as examples. So um, it turns out that there are 500,000 people that have actually answered puzzles so far in the last six months. So this exists only since uh, six months. and. Uh, we have um, seen very funny solutions. So uh, here the typical solution is actually x minus 2 times x. And of course, we know that that's the same. And, uh, but uh, now suddenly we see what problems, what people, um, uh, which programs they write. And so there are hundreds of uh, challenges here. And uh, there's also a live feed. Um, let me see whether there's a live feed, where in some sense you can actually figure out who's actually currently using um, the system. For example, server side 6 uh, tried to challenge the Caesar cipher and so on. Okay, so going back, what did we actually learn? Um, so uh, one thing is, uh, is that you can really excite people if you actually make something a game. We didn't expect that it would take off so uh, nicely. 
And uh, the way that you can really uh, excite people is if you actually build a social community around it. So there's this live feed, but there are also, in some sense, champions. This, there's now also uh, automatic coursework with automatic grading in, uh, in PEX for Fun. And what I think is most exciting is that we go back to our analytics, because now we have 500,000 programs in our database that we can know and we know what people wrote from one version to the next until they solved the problem. Or sometimes they didn't solve the problem at all. And we can see as what's actually the thing that they are stumbling over. Is it an abstraction? Uh, why didn't they actually make progress um, more quickly? So uh, if you want to work on uh, this research, uh, feel free to contact us or, or play with Packs for Fun or add puzzles or solve them. Um, the last topic. So, uh, the, the internet is great, but I think uh, what happens uh, even more rapidly than the internet is actually that cell phone uh, usage is uh, uh, outgrowing even internet usage. And so, uh, in last quarter of 2010, there were more smartphones being sold, including tablets, than PCs. So, desktops as well as laptops. But these guys, oh actually, there is my guy. These are actually as powerful as PCs 10 years ago. And uh, the new generation has already dual core. Um, and when we look back, when I started programming, I started on a uh, um, yeah, Commodore 64 that had actually much fewer memory than this one. If you think about uh, the processing power of this one, that's better than what uh, Knuth used when he developed tech, for example, or that's better than what uh, Unix was developed on. So the question is, why can't we program this one? So forget about laptop and PC, uh, and PC. Can't we actually program the phone on the phone? So what would it need? You need to rethink. Because this guy is so small, how do you actually enter your programs? How do you de debug it? How do you run it? You want to make it easy discoverable. You want to use cloud services. Uh, we have seen the translator this morning. I want to use just a translation from here. The funny thing is, the next thing is, as I said earlier, I think sharing is really important. How, if you develop on this one, how do we share the programs with somebody else? How do you share the data with somebody else? Maybe on Facebook. How do you do, if you want to program a distributed system? How do you program distributed systems if you only have a phone in your hand? And uh, how do we do privacy and security? So there are lots of fun problems with this uh, new device. And we've made some progress. Um, so uh, a month ago, we released Touch Studio. This is a programming environment on this device. And so that changes everything, because this device is continuously connected to the cloud. And we'll write some programs uh, in a minute. So that changes, in some sense, w what you do right away. It has lots of sensors, which changes, in some sense, uh, makes this much more attractive, because you get GPS or you get accelerators. Um, and you can uh, yeah, uh, build lots of fun stuff. So. For whom do we think that this touch studio is? We think that professional people will still use their big machines and their big screens. But there are many people, like teenagers, like my son or my daughter, who just want to, uh, let's say, have some fun and write little programs. There are millions of people who write Excel or Word macros. They should be able to write and personalize their phone. So with this, uh, let me get started. And uh, I want to see whether we can program something together, something very simple on this device. Um, OK, so the first thing is I have to log in. Um, OK, so here is the device. Um, OK, so uh, Touch Studio is on the left. Oh, let me start this one. And uh, do you see anything? It's very probably difficult. So let me start coding. Um, so I'll click this button. And so I want to write a completely new script. So uh, what do we want to do? Is I said this is continuously connected to the internet. So let's, let me add uh, a new method. Um, let's call that simply go. And so what should this new method do? It should go to the web 
and actually collect the pit pictures of Cartagena. So how can I write this? So I go and say I add something. So what do I want to do first is I introduce a local. So uh, as you see, this is a structured editor. Um, where in some sense you only see little fragments all the time. But then uh, the keyboard is actually uh, s very smart. It knows typically what you want to do. So I said uh, I want to uh, do a web search. So I say, okay, I want to do a web search. There's the web button. So I'll take my web. So then I want to search for images. Wonderful. And I want to see as, uh, uh, let me try to find images of this beautiful city. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so typing is actually the most difficult here. Programming is actually much easier. Cartagena, that's what I typed here. So, um, and so this is my first statement. Res result is a, a web search of images of Cartagena. So then I'm done with this uh, line. So then I say, okay, I want to add something more. What do I want? I want to print out all the images that I find. And so we can do that with a for each loop. And so for each no, nows, no, nows, no, which uh, local variables are in scope, and it offers me, oh, there are, in some sense, the set of links that I actually collected earlier in my web search. So I'm done. So I go over for each over all links. And as a consequence, it says, okay, my local is now link. So then I'll uh, say, okay, add one more line. And uh, what I want is that for each link that I find, for each link that I find, I want to post it to the wall. My wall is actually my display on my uh, device. And so this is all I had to write. So let's run this program and see what happens. Um, so we are searching Bing. We are loading. And here are all the pictures from the web. And uh, some are faster loading, some are slower loading. Here's another one. And you should actually recognize this uh, wonderful place. OK, so this was really, uh, what did I enter? I entered really three lines in order to a web search for images. If you go and uh, try to find a web search on this device, this is Bing. Uh, as you probably see, Bing doesn't have actually an image search on the mobile phone, so we just added some functionality that is missing on this device with three lines. Let me show you something else, um, and uh, I want to go back. So it turns out that uh, this uh, um, uh, smartphones, they have actually great graphics engines. and. Uh, um, so uh, what do most people do when they use a smartphone? They actually play games with it. So let's write a little game. And so what's the mo the, for most games, what they do is they do some physical simulation. So let's do a little physical simulation. And so in order to write a game, we write now a 2D game, a 2D game, uh, where we actually want to have balls bouncing up and down based on, the, in some sense, the friction. And we want to use the accelerator. So if I move my, my phone, then I want to see that the balls, in some sense, always jump to the place where there's the biggest gravity. So here is the program. And I don't program it uh, again, but it's really this long. It's probably difficult to see. So what does it do? It, uh, maybe I'll, I'll show it, uh, explain it. It creates a board that's, in some sense, our physical environment, our 2D. And then it has one loop where I create, in some sense, balls, ellipses, and uh, simply says how, uh, how the elasti uh, elasticity looks like. And then I have another loop where I look at the accelerator in, in this uh, device. And depending on the accelerator, I move the balls. So let's see how that looks like. And here is, in some sense, the whole program. So I asked for 20 balls of different size. And uh, it uses the accelerator in order to determine for, the, for the, in the physical world where they should actually go and uh, how they, in some sense, should uh, fly through space. And this is how most pro games are done. So actually, 50% of all games are not much bigger than 80 lines of code if you have the right abstraction. So 
Now, since this is a wonderful device, I actually have also my media on my, my device. I cannot only take pictures from the web, but why don't I, uh, so here I, I just uh, had balls flying through the air. I can also say, is, oh, instead of taking a ball, I take a thumbnail of the pictures that are on my phone and I let them rotate. So let me do that. And so this is uh, the pictures. And I think you get the picture. So the only thing that I've now changed in this program is that instead of creating ellipses, I go to my media on my device, that's actually the pictures, and I take some random pictures, and now I let, uh, do the same thing and I put a different background in it. And so the whole program is this much. So you see everything. Uh, let's see what funny pictures I have. Here are my pictures on my phone. And you see that in some sense now I can flo have my pictures floating around. I could go on and show you how you use uh, Microsoft Translator and so on. Um, um, everything that you can imagine is typically um, as small as this one. Um, all the programs are really simple. Um, it has an integration into Maps. Uh, it has an imp integration into OCR. And what is really the great news is since we are always connected to the web, we can use all the functionality on the web, for example, for speech translation. We don't have to do that on the phone. We can send the text over um, uh, to the cloud, and we just get the translated uh, text back. So um, with this, I want to conclude and uh, say, is, uh, what's the, 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 I think the really exciting thing is that uh, the cloud is there and mobile is there. And what you really want to do is actually bring them together. And if you think about what's the best programming environment, maybe programming on the phone is actually not so bad. But you have to change everything. Your normal input mechanism with a keyboard is suddenly replaced largely with touch. You, uh, your programming model suddenly changes uh, very uh, rapidly because you have to, in some sense, uh, get very easy access to all the different services that are there. Um, cloud integration, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it is also lots of danger because I could actually send also my uh, naked pictures into the cloud and who knows who sees them and who wants to see them in the first place. That's a different story. And, and of course, uh, you can imagine that that uh, uh, programming on the phone and running those scripts uh, is actually a relatively energy inefficient. And so if you really want to move that into mainstream, we have to think about how we make that much more energy efficient. Um, the good news is you can try this out. Uh, you can go to the Windows uh, Phone uh, Market Store or to this website and download it. And uh, so the latest version I showed you 1.2, one that has the graphics engine, 1.1 doesn't have the graphics engine, but it should come out every day now, so it's already registered. Um, this is meanwhile number 38 of the most popular uh, apps uh, on the Windows Phone. Uh, somebody told me if, if we would have done it for Android or iPhone, I wouldn't have to be here anymore um, if I would ask for money for it, but we don't. Uh, this is all free, and uh, it's, it's really a fun to use the device, but also fun to do the research for the devices. So uh, summary is I think uh, everything that I talked to you today is uh, we have submitted papers, uh, no paper has rejected yet, so, but it's so fresh that I can't give you the links to those papers. But uh, so software analytics, I think we really see that it will change the, the software development process quite rapidly. And uh, within Microsoft, there's more demand for it than we can handle. And it really enables making better data-driven decisions. The uh, logic-based tools really help make better software artifacts because you can check lots of properties, not only equivalences, but I will show you many more um, tomorrow if you would come to the booth. And uh, I think as, uh, whenever you, you work in software engineering, it's such a fascinating area because it changes every year. And, uh, and the cloud and the phone are really fun uh, areas. And let me just mention one area that I haven't talked about. What about software engineering and games? So I showed you some of the little games. It turns out that games is currently a $50 billion market. There are almost no people who 
So there are lots of people that develop games, but very few use software engineering principles in this development. So there's a huge potential, in some sense, um, to advance uh, 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 the game development with the things that we have learned in traditional software engineering. With this, I want to conclude. I really want to thank you for listening, but I also have to thank all those people. These are people in my team, and oops, and uh, the one in the leftmost column are actually the people that which work I presented over here, but the others helped uh, in many, many ways. There are lots of links. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to talk to you.